Welcome back, everybody. This is Peter Schiff at SchiffRadio.com. And joining me now is Harmon Caslow, who is a co-producer of Atlas Shrugged Part 1, uh, which is scheduled to be released April 15th. Uh, the trailer is on YouTube if you want to check it out. I, I watched it myself. It's been seen by close to a million people so far, which I guess is uh, pretty good. And I know Atlas Shrugged has enjoyed a resurgence of popularity. I mean, it's always been popular, uh, but the last couple of years uh, particularly so. In, you know, Harmon, one thing that, that, that struck out at me when I watched the trailer is, you know, when Ayn Rand wrote her novel in the 1950s, of course she was writing in an industrial America, and so, you know, Dagny Taggart is a, a, a railroad magnet, and, and, and Hank Reardon is an industrialist with a steel company. Um, it seemed like if we're doing this in modern day, which you're, you're, the film is set in a modern environment, I see them on their cell phones, you'd think maybe that Dagny would have a string of retail outlets, and uh, maybe uh, Hank Reardon would be like a hedge fund guy, or maybe he'd be a dot-com guy. It seems like these type of industries seem pretty irrelevant to the American economy today, unfortunately. No, I, I, I know. First off, it's great to be on your show. You know, the, the, the book is over 50 years old, but the world that uh, Ayn Rand described uh, in her book really is the world of today. I mean, a world where capitalism has become a dirty word, a world where government power is escalating, individual liberties being attacked, collectivism is growing. Yeah, this is a world we hear about every night on the news. And and yet, you know, her story is one that describes heroes. You know, the kinds of heroes who have made this nation great, who in her words, you know, moved the world. Mm -hmm. And in that world they were running railroads and producing new metals. And instead of encouraging those who produce the lifeblood of our country, the government bureaucrats created laws to stymie their achievement. Mm -hmm. um, somehow in the delusion that equality is achieved by bringing the top down. So um, it's the individual against the state. The heroes of Atlas Shrug have had enough. And I think that that you know, theme is still relevant to what's going on today. Oh, it's absolutely relevant. My only question was in in the, the the types of businesses that they were in. People might look at it, you know, like you know the railroad industry and the steel industry. I mean, that's that's not really where the titans of American industry are today. Unfortunately, we've deindustrialized. We have this huge trade deficit now, and so uh, you know we've evolved. I mean, maybe that might be more characteristic of. Uh, industries in China or something where you'd have uh, the, the railroads, but certainly with you know President Obama talking about high speed trains, uh, you know I think that that part might 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 uh, strike a, cor a chord. Um, you know I know Anne Rand herself initially was writing as she tried to write a screenplay for Atlas Shrugged, and I think she died while she was working on it. Did you use any of any of her original screenplay, or is it did you, did you start from scratch? Oh, we, no, we, we started from scratch, and, and I know if any of your listeners are interested in sort of getting more background on how we got to this point, uh, they really should go visit our website, Atlas Shrugged Part 1, the number one, uh, dot com. But, but we, we started with a, a clean slate. Um, you know, John Aglioloro, the other producer of the project, the, the gentleman that owns the rights to make the movie, you know, acquired those rights 19 years ago, uh, not as a filmmaker, but as an entrepreneur and someone uh, with a vision that, that the book should be made into a movie and could never attract uh, financing from a studio to get it off off the ground. And I think in large part is because they deviated you know, from the story of the book, and they tried to reimagine and change what was going on there. And as they embarked down that road, it just took them to a path where you got so far away from what, what the book was about that uh, it, it lost its meaning. So yeah. we just went with a pure, faithful adaptation of the book. Yeah, I think you know one of the problems you might think of in in writing a screenplay is what the the powerful parts of the book. You have these long passages where you know they're really speaking and in about politics and and a philosophy, but it's pages and pages of uh, of uh, a soliloquy. Uh, I mean, how how do you handle that stuff in 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 the film version? Well, I mean, you know, there there people who have read the book. Um, for the most part, become incredibly inspired about the book and then very passionate about what they just read. And that did create a little bit of a problem for us in that, you know, there are so many good, 
speeches uh, and discussions that are made in the book. How do you choose? And, and what we ended up doing was you know, trying to find a cinematic thread, something that would be accessible to a very wide audience, but at the same time, as frequently as possible, take Ahn's words, put them into the character's mouth so that the people who you know, have read the book some many, many years ago could go into the theater, experience something that they had read, um, but at the same time expose it to a population completely unaware of what the book was about and have them also appreciate uh, you know, what, what Anna written yeah, uh, when the book this, came out. Hopefully this movie could reach an audience and well beyond those who have already read her book, and that might inspire them to pick up a copy of, uh, of, uh, of her work and, and, and read it and get the full benefit of of that, you know, 900 pages as opposed to just the movie. Now, I, I know I remember reading about uh, that, you know, when, when The Fountainhead was, was, was adapted for a screen with Gary Cooper, and I, I saw the movie. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I forget. I saw it years and years ago, so I can't even remember, you know, how much I liked it or whether I thought it was mediocre. I mean, I know I loved the book, and I watched it, but I know that Ayn Rand supposedly was very disappointed in the entire movie. Um, and... I don't know. I mean, do you, do, you, do, you, do you know what her criticism were of the of, of the Fountainhead? And do you think you might have made a, a, a movie that she would actually say, "Hey, I, I enjoy that one. I'm proud of it." Wow. I mean, that's a that's a tough question. She was very very involved in uh, in the Fountainhead and the movie The Fountainhead. And I think that you know sometimes you know the author of a book might fall in love with just every word that they put on the page. And sometimes it takes you know somebody who is. Uh, a little bit more removed from that, but understands the story and philosophy to perhaps execute something that 's cinematic i mean there 's a very, very big difference um, you know, the, the problem that you run into when you adapt the book is you know people have an imagination. Uh, and when they're reading the book, I mean, they're imagining what's going on and what the words on those page mean. Um, we didn't set out to try to capture that imagination. Our, our goal was to just you know give out give a accessible, entertaining um, adaptation of the book that would appeal to not only the literary and political fan base, but also provide a movie that would a- appeal to women seeking inspiration by virtue of this Dagny Taggart uh, character as a strong, smart, tenacious woman getting things done, and, and also parents seeking inspiration where you know they can see how hard work, rational self-interest can be guides to greater yeah. personal happiness. Yeah, I noticed in too in the trailer that you don't I mean there's nobody in the movie that I that I recognize I mean so I'm assuming that you were able to produce it on a lower budget but do you think you know the lack of any kind of star power or any kind of names uh, and had you even thought about trying to get you know Hollywood names in this or well, you know, a couple of reasons. First off, you know, again, your listeners, they can go to our site, atlasshrugpart1.com. They will get some information about the cast. Uh, they'll also be able to see some pictures and see the decisions that we made. But but we started out with the premise that the book is incredibly big. The book is bigger than us. Um, it's bigger than any actress. Um, and, you know, we, we were under such a tight time frame anyway that for us to have tried to embark on the casting of – you know, a marquee name or an A-lister probably would have derailed the project to a point where it would never have gotten into production. So, you know, we focused it, focused on you know casting people who were incredibly talented, very passionate, courageous you know actors that we believe could uh, execute the roles in a very you know faithful way. And I think that they did an incredible and amazing job. All right. Well, I can't wait to see it. You know, if you've got an extra Blu-ray, you got to ship it over to me so I can talk about it before the movie comes out. But anyway, don't go away. We've got more uh, about Atlas Shrug, the movie, after this break. You're listening to Peter Schiff Show on ShiffRadio.com. Welcome back, everybody. This is Peter Schiff, along with my guest, Harmon Caslow, co-producer of Atlas Shrug Part 1. Now... One of the ways I guess you dealt with this is you're you're you're, you're coming out with three parts, kind of like uh, the Back to the Future uh, uh, trilogy. Are you shooting all three simultaneously? No, I, actually, it's very similar to um, you know really the Lord of the Rings, which which itself was split into three parts: the book, 
Atlas Shrug is split into three parts. Uh, the first part, um, it's really a great way to start off by telling the story because it's, there's a lot of character development in there and it, and it really sets the context and the world in which, you know, the balance of the story takes place. And in part two, you have, you know, a very famous money speech that is, you know, incredibly applicable to, uh, you know, a lot of the issues and concerns that people have today. And then in part three, you have the, uh, the John Galt, uh, philosophical speech. So, uh, we haven't tackled those yet. We're in the process of writing the screenplay for part two. It should be coming out uh, again on tax day, April 15th in 2012, and then we hope to follow the following year, April 15th, 2013, with part three. All right, so there, there's going to be about a one-year interval between between each part. Exactly, and that's, that's about the period of time it will take us to uh, you know, you know, write the screenplay and produce the film. That seems pretty good. I mean, this is better than having to wait a couple of years uh, for the uh, for the for the second ones or the third, the, the sequels. Uh, let me ask you, how is the Hollywood community? Because you know, Hollywood historically is is very left, and you know, whenever you see a Hollywood movie, the villains are always the business people, uh, and the the heroes are always uh, you know the altruists or the people that work for government or or, or, or something like that. Uh, how is this uh, being uh, embraced or shunned out there in Hollywood, and what's what's the buzz on it, if any? Well, I mean, first off, you know, this is not the kind of movie that Hollywood embraces. Uh, e- even though Atlas Shrugged's been read by millions uh, all over the globe, no studio, you know, was willing to produce it. So, so in the spirit of true individualism, you know, we took that on our, ourselves. Uh, we couldn't find a studio that was interested in distributing it, so we're self-distributing it ourselves. And lo and behold, as you started off uh, mentioning at the top of the show, um, we've had almost a million people you know, view our trailer. Uh, it's available at our YouTube channel, Atlas Shrug Part 1, and that is a phenomenal number. Uh, you know, the studios have to throw tens of millions of dollars to market and promote a movie. I mean, we have a book uh, th- that you know millions of people have read. There's a philosophy that you know your audience and millions like your audience have embraced in this country. Nobody's producing anything for them. On April fifteenth, there is a movie. It's Atlas so, Shrugged so, Part One. So you couldn't find a Hollywood studio to distribute it. Uh, yeah, we 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 offered it up. We uh, showed it to a number of them. Um, they felt that the, uh, the the subject matter was not one that uh, you know w- would draw an audience into into the theaters. We think they're completely <laughs> wrong. Of course. Well, um, I mean, I'm sure if it was some kind of socialist uh, Marxist type uh, movie, uh, they they would have said, "Oh, yeah, there's a plenty big audience for that." Well, how many screens are you guys opening on? Well, you know, we started. Um, you know, the, for an exhibitor to want it to um, have this movie in their theater, they need to see the movie. Uh, we, we literally finished the movie on February 20th. We sent out some DVDs. We started to get theaters. Yesterday, 17 exhibitors came on board. Right now, we're in 40 theaters. Uh, our target is 100. By April 15th, our booking agents told me that uh, you know, we could have several hundred if we wanted. What, what's important for us is that you know, our audience is awake and they understand the urgency of going to the theater that weekend to see the movie so that the exhibitors know that there's a true interest in movies that bear this message. Yeah, did, you, did, you, did you screen the movie at CPAC? Uh, actually, what we did is uh, we, we used that event to uh, kick off the exhibition of our trailer. Oh, okay. Um, and so, you know, we, we packed the room. We were competing against, uh, you know, Ron Paul, yet we had an overflow uh, attendance at the room just to kind of indicate, you know, what sort of audience there is for this. And, and the video then uh, was placed on YouTube, and we were – Seeing views come in at the rate of ten to fifteen thousand per hour, so we got just an enormous groundswell response from that, uh, um, you know, kickoff event. Yeah, well, I think I think more people are gonna are gonna watch the video. We'll talk about it. I'll put it up on my uh, on my YouTube channel and get and get people to check it out. Uh, but but certainly, I, I I think your idea of 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 trying not to have any characters bigger than the book itself actually makes a lot of sense. So it, it, you it, it, so you you don't you, people aren't coming into it 
with identifying the characters that they see with anybody else that they've played. So it's really like a clean slate, and you're seeing you know the the Hank Reardon or the the, the Dagny Daggert uh, um, uh, characters for the first time, and you don't have any you don't have anything to think about because you haven't seen the actors really in any other roles. No, absolutely. I mean, you know. We believe that those who value what America, you know, has made, you know, what made America great will find the message of this movie haunting. Uh, and we hope that it inspires them to continue to fight for freedom with renewed vigor. That's the purpose of going to the, to the theater yeah. to see this movie, and not to go see, you know, someone from the tabloids, uh, you know, that's made it into a motion picture. And I think it is very important because I think we are on the cusp of a real collapse in the U.S. economy because we have drifted away. Way, uh, from the the values that, that it were you know re- represented by that novel and now and now your movie and I think we are at a crossroads when this real economic crisis happens when the dollar crisis hits when the bonds collapse when we have a real economic co- collapse in this country we're going to have to choose we're going to have to choose between going back uh, to free market capitalism uh, or uh, totalitarianism it's going to be a very clear choice and people need to know that 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 the, this collapse, this misery that we're about to go through as a people is because of government, because of socialism, because of central planning and central banking and all the things uh, that Ayn Rand warned us about. They're coming right now. They're coming right now. And, you know, and, and sometimes I think it, it would be great if we could have a, 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 a John Galt type movement uh, for the people that do uh, run the country that are being vilified right now and, and attacked, uh, that maybe they should go on strike. And, and, you know, let's see how well the country runs uh, without the entrepreneurs, without the people who innovate and take risks and, and, and employ people and create products and provide services that everybody else just takes for granted and assumes that it all happens just magically because there's demand. Exactly. I mean, you hit the nail on the head. You know, this is a movie about now. I mean, there's turmoil in the Middle East. The price of gasoline is spiraling upward. Our businesses are being strangled with government regulation. All this sounds very familiar, and all of this was things that she wrote about nearly 50 years ago when, when the book you know, was published. Yeah. And, and now you know, people can go in and see a story, hopefully one that they can relate to, hopefully one that they'll be inspired by, that will go, you know what, we've yeah. really got to get off our seats well, and we I have can't, to push the change. I can't wait to see it. I'm not sure that the, the Academy will be uh, nominating it for any Oscars, even if it is Oscar-worthy, uh, because you know all the bias they have there. But hopefully you will succeed where it counts at the box office. And I wish you all the luck, and, and hopefully uh, that movie can inspire as many people as the book did. Anyway.